It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. I, I want to discuss with you for a second a story that we had on the website yesterday talking about Obamacare ads stereotyping blacks. Uh, we dissected six different ads from the administration from uh, the span of last year up until this year, targeting blacks. Uh, many of these ads, four of the six, dealt with sports. One dealt with a parental issue, and the other dealt with a, a issue of an individual who needed the help of a white man to enroll. Uh, did you get a chance to take a look at these, and what were your thoughts? Well, I've not seen the ads themselves, though. I, I, I you know, thank you, you know, I appreciate that you shared with me the work that went into your story. Um, but I would just say that I'm not surprised, and I would find it perfectly consistent with how media operate and uh, how they extend this persistent relationship. Um, from the material world held by black people with the state itself into the immaterial world of media. That is to say, the way we're treated in real life is often uh, a mirror uh, or, or justified by the way we're treated in popular culture and media. It seems like, though, if you have a black president, though, that that changes, right? Well, not for me. I mean, again, I'm, I'm part of that, that uh, unfortunately, I think too small uh, minority of people who were not supportive of President Obama's uh, rise to the presidency or even to the Senate, not because, of course, we don't like to see uh, black success, but, but primarily because we don't see this as a marker of black success, but that we see this as a sort of a darkening, uh, so to speak, of a, of a very white supremacist process. Uh, uh, and political pattern of behavior uh, that in the very tradition of neo-colonial rule uh, just, just took from among the many of the oppressed one who could represent uh, them at least symbolically as, as a leader of the country and of, of, of uh, American empire. But uh, So, so I, I think it's perfectly consistent that even while we see the emergence of a black president, we see uh, an increasing devolution of the conditions of the black community, which is why Kwame Ture said accurately so long ago that black power is not black visibility. Let's unpack that for a second, because you talked about colonialism. What, what does that concept mean? You're saying it's always there, it's running in the background. So by colonialism, I just mean to, to look to extend uh, – uh, an intellectual tradition that looks to analyze or interpret the, the conditions and history of black people in this country as we would any colonial or colonized population. That is, that as the West, uh, as the European West developed its colonies overseas in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, um, the establishment of the United States as a colonial outpost brought settler colonialism to this hemisphere, to this, to this continent, and uh, recreated those patterns of, of colonial exploitation from within the the, uh, the country itself, that the populations, specifically the indigenous and then subsequently the African-descended populations, were colonized here and, and, and held in a, in, a, in a colonial relationship. And as Fanon, Franz Fanon once summarized, colonialism is simply the complete and total conquering of a land and people. Um, so what we see is rather than uh, the the myths of democracy, meritocracy, plutocracy, or not, sorry, it is plutocracy, but uh, a pluralism, uh, what we have is, is a, a colonial relationship between black people in the United States, which is why we see a persistence in the uh, uh, devolution of material conditions of black people. This is why we continue to see the, the persistent rates of incarceration, police brutality, gaps in income and wealth, uh, 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 and, and to, you, to, to the point of your most recent story, uh, including access to health care, quality health care, education, food, shelter, housing, etc. Uh, these persistent inequalities, rather than, I think, uh, being trying to, to, rather than, I think, being able to be interpreted or interpretable through the myths uh, as I said a moment ago, of meritocracy, pluralism, democracy, egalitarianism, and so on, uh, which would then argue that black people are, are held in this inequality because of some sort of persistent uh, flawed culture or some sort of um, 
uh, you know, uh, natural inability to, to succeed or achieve, uh, that these, these inequalities are part of, of the required exploitation necessary to maintain a powerful, uh, what some have called more recently the 1%, uh, or to, 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 to achieve wealth, safety, both physically and psychologically. Black people have to continue to be treated poorly materially and through image and symbol. So that is, as Fanon also said, that it requires a polydimensional method to hold people in this kind of uh, persistent and permanent exploitation. So after the physical violence of enslavement, of wiping out rebellions, of killing off and exiling and imprisoning the best and brightest of our leaders, uh, after all of that comes the psychological component, the, the symbolic component of, man of managing this colony, which requires that we be represented uh, as uh, uh, white supremacy would require us to be represented in popular media. Uh, that is to say that you cannot create the, 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 the colonizer is simultaneously creating itself as it's creating the colonized. So you can't judge, uh, so white supremacy requires an anti-blackness, uh, to be depicted and carried out in, in both in terms of media and symbolism and in the material world in terms of the actual inequality that we feel and that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's really what I'm trying to say here, that, that if we're really to understand how media function and what our relationship to the state actually is, we have to um, uh, find another interpretive lens uh, uh, than the one that is provided or developed for us. And, and my preferred uh, approach is through internal colonialism or uh, the colonial uh, analogy. When you talk about internal colonialism, you know, Sousa has talked about, you know, President Obama is anti-colonialist. That doesn't seem to jive at all with what you're saying. No, I mean, my argument is, and this is, again, why I would see the persistence of this pattern of negative black representation carried out through his own administration or in attempts to promote what his administration is actually doing, um, uh, because he is the neo-colonial uh, uh, attachment to the apparatus. I mean, this is something that has gone on for centuries, where segments of the colonized are raised up uh, as leaders by the state, by the colonial power, and put into positions of, of prominence uh, to give the appearance of change, to give the appearance uh, uh, of progress, or to deny the existence of the colonial relationship. And this is, again, why Kwame Ture challenged us years ago to realize that black power is not black visibility or that black visibility is not black power, so that we should not be confused by the presence of black faces in high places or the black presence of, or the presence of blackness in popular culture, or, or film, television, otherwise. Um, what we have to recognize or realize or, or witness or, or, or focus on are the actual material conditions or the lived experiences of black people. And when we look at those, uh, I think the colonial relationship is quite clear, which is why we have the persistent, uh, most recently, the persistent police violence, uh, the need for protest, et cetera, and why the state looks to adjust itself to, to account for and accommodate those protests, which is why, and, you know, this is probably a topic for another conversation, why some of us are critical of the, the constant reappearance of, of people like Al Sharpton and, and, and Jesse Jackson uh, uh, whenever there's some sort of crisis, and that these two are, 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 you know, lead the way in coming out to calm everybody down and cajole everybody and offer them a safe outlet to, to express their concerns, an outlet that doesn't actually ever attack or address or encourage the kind of organization we need uh, to, to, to uh, excise this colonial relationship. So, so I hear you saying that, you know, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are pawns too, especially when we see what happened in Ferguson. President Obama has, you know, he said, I'm not a black, I'm not the black president. I'm not the, he told Black Enterprise, I'm not the black president. Though basically don't look at me. Now all of a sudden Ferguson happens and he, and he launches himself out there on BET talking about how he's got this, he's understood this for all, all, all this time, but he's the same guy that's turned around and told everybody, in the national setting beyond BET, that, hey, look, you know, there's a fear out there that there is not a inadequate, there's an adequate uh, treatment of blacks by the police. But he says to black people when he's on BET, I understand, I understand, I, I understand. 
So uh, is is any of this remedied with any black face that we have out there currently right now? Well, I mean, not that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, the, those that are uh, that ascend to these levels of, of high political position have all done so after having compromised or never agreed with, in the first place, any real sense of radical politics. So uh, these this leadership, to a point I was trying to make a little bit ago, is the illegitimate heir to those who have been previously exiled, assassinated, or who are still imprisoned as political prisoners to this day. So I I'm unaware of any popularly known, well-positioned, so-called black leader who is able or willing to lead a challenge that would actually upset this fundamental colonial relationship, which is why I think we have to uh, do a lot more to organize ourselves and develop uh, alternative parties, pol political movements, etc. This is what Dr. Cornell West kind of calls the prophetic tradition. Well, I mean, well, what he, yeah, what he calls the prophetic tradition is the tradition of, of uh, primarily black spokespeople who have led the way in challenging the injustice or the injustices that we all have to deal with, uh, which is why he has found himself outside of the preferred grouping of uh, acceptable black spokespeople and leaders. Um, this is why he himself has been replaced by the Michael Eric Dysons and the uh, uh, um, uh, um, Melissa Harris Perrys and, and, and people like that, because even he has gone uh, too far now uh, to, to in down his own traditional road, so to speak. I guess I want to make this crystal clear. So should we believe anything? I mean, given the fact that we can't believe this advertisement is degrading to black people, uh, should we believe anything that President Obama has to tell us, or, or for, that, for any, that matter, any black leader that we've got out there, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, on? Well, it's not necessarily a matter of believing or disbelieving. I mean, I think in many ways we should believe them and take them at their word. When Obama says, I'm not the president of black people, we should understand that that means I'm not going to do anything specifically to address your specific inequalities, which is uh, something that he had to agree to do even before he was unveiled before the world in the 2004 National Democratic Convention. Uh, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, when, when compared to the leaders that they, they claim to, to be uh, uh, extending the work of, we can see, particularly in terms of the Dr. King, that those two have decidedly walked away from the, the radical uh, politics that Dr. King was representing at the end of his life, which was why King himself was marginalized and dismissed by the civil rights establishment, the mainstream press, uh, many traditional, specifically white uh, funding sources, etc. cetera. Um, and this is sort of what I'm saying. So I think that uh, what, what these people are are the adjustments made by the state to uh, accommodate any shifts in public opinion or popular movements in this country around the world. And it's been, I think, largely successful in, in uh, uh, managing the righteous outrage of, of, of we, the, the still colonized population and populations in this country. And this is, again, why the persistent inequality still exists and continues largely unfettered. In fact, worsening. I mean, the, you know, what, what has happened for the elite just since Obama's election is, uh, uh, is a tremendous, I think, indicator of what is going on. Now we have, you know, more money has been made under, under his presidency for the elite than uh, had been the case uh, uh, under the previous presidents uh, before him. Uh, and the, the potential for uprising or rebellious response has decreased as people have found it difficult uh, across the left spectrum to find their voice uh, under his presidency because so many people for so long, I think this is slowly starting to change, but it's, it's too late at this point, uh, for so long people have uh, uh, assumed he was this change, the, the, the yes we can that he stole from the farm workers uh, under Cesar Chavez uh, and totally reframed it, <laughs> recast it in English and then re recast its politics. Uh, for his campaign, um, but people have been, you know, subsumed beneath this, this, this spectacle. And it was so well done, and he's so talented and, very, and, and skilled and well taught, 
and prepared, uh, that it has been extremely difficult, I think, to, to make clear to people. But I think as people start to see that their conditions have not changed and, in fact, in many cases have gotten worse, um, you know, and raise questions around the, the extension of wars, the extensions of, extension of inequality, and here we go again, as my comrades in the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement have pointed out, uh, and Arlene Eisen specifically, the, the head researcher on this report, that black people are killed in this country by the police every 28 hours. And this is something that um, uh, uh, even President Obama's presence isn't, uh, isn't able to, to, to uh, uh, omit or dismiss. Uh, and the rebelliousness in response, he's not even able to quell. So what he has to do is only hope, uh, at least quell entirely, what he has to do is to use what the Washington Post called his surrogate, which is uh, Al Sharpton, to uh, lead the way in encouraging black people to stay calm, protest only within prescribed, uh, uh, you know, manners and me methods, and then, of course, at the end of the day, only uh, seek redress through the electoral vote, uh, which means come right back to the Democratic Party, which is, again, why we, we have to develop other alternative methods and parties and movements uh, that will really challenge this, this, uh, um, this colonial relationship. So when he deviates from saying that he is not the president of black America and when he gets on BET and he decides to be the president of black America, the leader of black America, we shouldn't believe him. Well, I mean, I'm, when, when Obama says he's not the president of black America, I think we absolutely should believe him. And I, 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 maybe I wasn't clear, but that's, that's exactly what I'm trying no, to say. No, no, no. I agree with you. I'm just yeah. saying that now, you know, when he gets on black, you know, entertainment television, and then tells us that, you know, this is the way you should behave. I really am concerned about this. We shouldn't believe that he's really concerned oh. about these things because he's doing something that's not in our interest. He's doing it in colonial interest. Yes, he's, he's serving the, the state, and, and he's serving the people that uh, funded his rise to fame and prominence and whose wealth he has only sought to increase since he's been in office. Uh, and this is, yeah, and, and to, to the point of your piece, uh, of your research about these ads, this is, I think, this speaks more to how the black community has and its media outlets have been played uh, by the Obama administration, have been used, have been used to, 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 to wh where, where the black press and black media space should have been leading the critique, leading the, the, the cry uh, to uh, um, uh, the, the critical cry uh, saying, where is where is our uh, salvation in all of this? Where is any president, never mind just for black people, but where is the president for the people, period? Uh, they have been used quite, you know, by Obama to, to be the leading spokespeople to, to, to that, that is, the black press has been turned into this, this, this uh, echo chamber of either Obama's policies or uh, uh, marginalizing dissent. Uh, you know, this goes back to his earliest days in office when he held some of those first meetings with the black press, invited them into his office. They met with Valerie Jarrett, one of his administra administrative uh, 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 advisors. Uh, yeah, advisor, I think that's the word I was looking for. You know, she brings them in there. They, they all are invited. They're all excited to be there to cover the first black president, to be in the White House. And, uh, uh, but, and what I think that is clearly, you know, was designed and, and subsequent meetings were clearly designed to do was to, to, to undercut any potential um, uh, critique of what was, was, was going to be done or what, what uh, has happened. And I think this is exactly what, what um, has gone on again. In, in, in many ways, not to, to, to simplify or equate them, but this is kind of like what Bill Cosby just said to the Washington Informer, where he said he expected the black press to be better in their treatment of, of the, the, the allegations of rape. Um, and what he was really saying was, I expected you all to defend me. I expected you all to do a better job uh, than the mainstream press has done in, in covering my back. Uh, and what I think we need and what the, what, what the black press should be doing and more of the black press should be doing is raising that critical, these critical questions around what has been the value to us of having a black president. And if there is, by my analysis, very little benefit at having a black president, what then does that actually say about the presidency itself? What does it say about our relationship to the state? Uh, and there I think we will have many more fruitful kinds of conversations and, and, and potential outcomes in terms of what to do next. And since you raised it, so the black press should be defending Bill Cosby. 
No, I don't think that at all. I, what I'm saying is that, that, that the attempt of Bill Cosby was to do what Obama has done, which was to say, uh, cover me. You were all supposed to, you know, cover me. Exactly. And I think, you know, I mean, my bias has is, is, is been clear and in some cases I think maybe even unfortunate in terms of uh, any, any latent uh, patriarchy or misogyny. But I felt that Bill Cosby should have been brought down a long time ago uh, for his last 10 year or, you know, sort of rant against the black poor than for any allegations, uh, belated allegations of, of rape. Uh, and that's not to say that I don't think that these women have a case or that the issue of rape isn't uh, important. Um, I just am admitting my own bias in, in, against Bill Cosby and this, this sort of 10-year problem I've seen uh, of him using his fame to justify the continued brutality and inequality of black people. Bringing it home, essentially, your thoughts about health care reform and the advertising targeting blacks is an extension of colonialism that we've seen. He is a neo-colonialist like we've never seen before in the office of the presidency. Well, I think that's a good point that we've never seen anything like this, which is why I think so many, including movement veterans, have had a hard time adjusting themselves to this, this latest version of the crisis. Uh, I think the research that you've developed here is, is important in that um, in it, I think in, in recognizing the extension of these patterns of media representation of black people with even under the, the – and caused by – the, uh, a black presidential administration, I think, is extremely important in, in unearthing what, what I've tried to describe as these colonial relationships that we have uh, and how they play out in mass media. Um, I also think um, this is what I would what, what I am a challenge is too strong a word, but what I would encourage you to to develop as you continue this research is this question around uh, what I think is 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 also the part of the problem that the media blitz and the advertising blitz defending uh, Obama's health care plan is also also works not only as you put out you described in extending this this stereotypical negative stereotypical depiction of black people in, in the press and the media but in giving cover to the fact that that Obama's health care bill um, for all that it may be in terms of a benefit over uh, you know an upgrade over what previously existed does more to deny any real progressive change uh, on this issue, which for me is universal health care, single-payer health care. Uh, and that argument has been removed from the discussion, removed from the table, as, as the fight has been entirely focused on Obama's health care plan, which, from, with few exceptions, is largely the plan that the Republicans, the right wing, and certainly the insur health insurance companies have been wanting for a long time. It's something that Richard Nixon advocated 40-some years ago, uh, you know, demanding that we all buy private uh, health care insurance, which still, by the way, leaves 30 to 40 million people uninsured. It still leaves many black poor people un uninsured entirely or underinsured. You know, a lot of people will get some sort of coverage, but that coverage will be meaningless if you have any real illness or, or devastating medical uh, uh, condition or issue that, that would arise in the family. So what we really need are movements to get what, what the rest of the so-called first world has evolved itself into, single-payer, nationalized health care, get rid of these insurance companies, um, and see through the media blitz advocating Obama's plan uh, and, and recognize that that plan is itself insufficient uh, and, and does a lot to, to buttress, again, this colonial relationship, that more to buttress it than I think to bring it down. And, and, and ultimately, that's what I think we need to have happen. Dr. Ball, how can folks find your book, and get in contact with you? Uh, it's very easy. Everything's at imixwhatilike.org, at imixwhatilike and all your relevant social media. And I thank you for the time and to your listeners. As, as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it.